Please take your Bible this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 4 for our scripture reading today. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We are going to read verses 9 through 16. <clears throat> verses 9 through 16. I'll begin to get on verse 9. You join me on 10. I'll read 11. We'll alternate like that until we end together on verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And I'll begin on verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Christians to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we ask you to add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Thank you again, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving your word to each of us today. Thank you for inspiring men of old that spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and then preserving those words for us so we have copies of them today. Lord, we believe that the Word of God is quick and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray it would be effectually working in each of us who believe this morning. Thank you for the good music today. Thank you for what we've heard. I pray you'll bless the special now and that it will continue to make our hearts ready to hear your word this morning. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Temptation for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. to Jesus he will carry you through ask the Savior to help you comfort strengthen and keep you he is willing to aid you he will carry you through shun Companions, bad language to stain God's name, hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind hearted and true. to Jesus he will carry you through ask the Savior to help you comfort strengthen and keep you he is willing to aid you he will carry you through to
look ever to Jesus. He will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Amen. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer this morning. We thank you, Lord, for already what we've heard today. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us and for the wonderful music that we've enjoyed today. Lord, we want to tell you that we love you this morning. We're so glad that you love us and that you sent your Son to be a substitute, the Lamb of God who dies on the cross for our sins. And Lord, we ask you now that you would speak to our hearts this morning through your word. Lord, as I prayed earlier, I believe the word of God is quick, it's alive, it's powerful. Lord, I ask you to use it in our hearts and lives this morning. Lord, I pray that the truth that we bring today from your word will be a help, be an encouragement to someone here this morning. So Father, may each of us... Uh, Open our heart to what you would want to say to us today. Help the one who's lonely here this morning. Help this to be something that each of us would keep in mind to minister to those who might feel loneliness or might guard against it in our own life. So, Father, go up and down these rows and in, up and down the aisle and then out of the rows and please minister to every single person here this morning. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I wanted to talk to you this morning on the cure for loneliness. You know, in the very first book of the Bible, when God created Adam, and then he brought all the animals uh, before Adam because he was trying to find a helpmeet for Adam. Because he said, it is not good that the man should be, what? Alone. So, he had all the animals, and Adam named them all, but it, God says, among all the animals, there was not found a helpmeet for Adam. And therefore, he put a sleep to come on Adam, and he took a rib out of his side, and he made a helpmeet for Adam, and Adam called her name Eve. I suppose one of the most heart-wrenching feelings that you ever could have is the feeling of loneliness. The feeling of being alone. And you can feel alone even if you're in a crowd. You can feel alone even if there's people around you. It's not the number of people around you, it's your relationship to them that determines your loneliness. We live in a very high speed, hurried world. And uh, how many of you understand we've all become cell phone junkies? You, you can drive down a highway almost, and certainly you can sit in a restaurant, and, and it seems like there's more people on their cell phone than are not on their cell phones. And we even get with high-speed Internet and texting and different ways to stream. In fact, they, they, I, I, don't, I don't know all that. Uh, the, 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 they say the cable companies are in trouble because people are getting their uh, entertainment and they're streaming from different places and nobody has a, a cable box anymore. They have it all on their mobile devices, but it's, uh, we, that, that's almost the way people are corresponding now. We have a lot of young people that have a difficult time with conversation. They, they can text great. They can text all kinds of messages, but to carry on a conversation, they're at a loss for words. It's very difficult for them to have a relationship or talk to someone face to face. So we have all these, it seems like we have all these different ways for people to stay in touch, whether it's social media or texting or the cell phone that goes with you everywhere you go. Uh, some of you remember the day when you left home, you left the phone on the wall because it, it had a cord on it. You couldn't go any further than that. And when you were away, you know what? You were away. Somebody called you, guess what they got? Nothing. 
It just rang and rang and rang and rang. You didn't even have answering machines. And you just let it ring a certain amount of times. You figure, well, they're not home. I'll try later. And you just tried later. And, and, and so we, yet, yet in spite of having all those ways to stay in touch with everybody, people are more lonely now than ever before. It's an amazing thing. In fact, loneliness is no respecter of persons. You can be wealthy and lonely. Ask Howard Hughes. You can be famous and beautiful and lonely. Ask Marilyn Monroe. You can be married and lonely. So people get married because they are lonely. And then they get divorced for the same reason. Because they're lonely. There's a rampant disease, someone said, there's a rampant disease among people today and it's called loneliness. Did you know, they say 70% more people live alone now than they did 30 years ago. It's a pretty staggering statistic. Who experiences loneliness? Well, the military man or woman serving our country can certainly experience loneliness. The newly divorced man or woman experiences loneliness. The college freshman away from home for the first time experiences loneliness. The widow or widower returning home from the cemetery experiences loneliness. The elderly person in the nursing home experiences loneliness. The new couple in a new town experiences loneliness. The single person who's never been married experiences loneliness. The missionary on the foreign field experiences loneliness. I have a story to share with you this morning about loneliness. And it deals with a pastor in Nevada. It was a, very, it was a growing church and it was a large church. He had served there for several years and God had blessed the church with really great growth. And they just broke ground on a brand new building that would seat several thousand. And when they broke ground on the building, it was not long after that, the pastor's wife hit him with the news that she was leaving him for another man. He was devastated. He immediately turned in his resignation to his church. He'd done nothing wrong. He'd been faithful. But his wife had decided to leave. The church leadership and the church voted for him to stay as their pastor. They did not want him to leave. So he stayed and the church continued to grow, but he was deeply wounded by his divorce. He said the first Christmas Eve after the divorce was the loneliest night of his life. He said, I finished a Christmas Eve service where over 2,000 people attended. Everyone left to go be with their families and he said, I went home to be alone. He got home and he was hungry, but there's nothing to eat in the house, so he went out to get something to eat, but everything was closed. It's Christmas Eve. Even McDonald's was closed. He said, I ended up at a little diner outside of Las Vegas called Sam's Place. Of course, if you've ever been in that area, that you, you got it, almost everything's a casino and a diner. And he said he walked in and they had a little restaurant there and he said, I sat inside and ate alone in a booth for four. It was like a bad dream. He said, I sat there thinking, I can't believe this is me. I just left 2,000 people that loved me. And I'm sitting here eating alone. Mashed potatoes and gravy. And he said, just when I thought it couldn't get any worse... He said, somebody put money in the jukebox. And Elvis started singing, Are You Lonesome Tonight? <laughs> and some of you are singing that in your head right now. I know. 
He said, I walked out of the restaurant and got into my car and I looked at dozens of people who had nothing else better to do on Christmas Eve than to throw quarters into swap machines. He said it was a lesson in loneliness that, I, that he would never forget. You know, there's many people in the Bible that experienced loneliness. David said in Psalm 25, 16, Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. David experienced loneliness. Jesus on the cross said what? My God, my God, why hast thou? Sounds lonely to me. Sounds like nobody there but him. In fact, did you notice in the passage we read this morning what Paul said in verse 16 of 2 Timothy 4? He said, at my first answer... No man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Paul, who had all these helpers, and you know, oftentimes at the end of his epistles, he'll list the different people that helped him and were co-laborers with him, and many appreciated, and even some women that helped him. And, and yet here he's arrested, and he's uh, going to go on trial, and, and he says, I look around, and there's nobody but me. Everybody forsook me. I think Paul felt a little lonely. I think he experienced loneliness alone. Be careful about criticizing someone who feels lonely. Be careful about being too harsh on someone who feels like they're alone. God said it's not good for man to be alone. The Bible teaches us that two are better than one. However, we know you can, have, you can have Cain and Abel or you can have Jacob and Esau and you can have brothers but not necessarily friends. Samson and Delilah show us you can have lovers but not friends. Job had three friends but he ended up calling them physicians of no value. Jesus had friends and Jesus had disciples, but they all forsook him and fled. In fact, one of them sold him for 30 pieces of silver. You know, a good friend's hard to find. You've heard me say this before. As a <clears throat> college student, just in my early 20s, listening to a man probably my age preach, and he used to preach and hold up his one hand and say, if you have that many true friends in your life, you are a blessed individual. And I remember sitting there as 21-year-old, 22-year-old, thinking, I got way more friends than that. And now that I'm the age he was, I can tell you that if you have that many true friends in your life, you're a blessed individual. What I didn't understand that he understood was he understood the meaning of what a friend is. I did not. Somebody says, no, wait a minute, I've got, I've got 438 friends on Facebook. <laughs> I got news for you. They ain't your friends. I hope some of them are. But that's not the definition of friendship. In fact, the cure for loneliness is friendship. It's friendship. And say, Pastor, that's what I need. I need friends. That's what I'm after. Well, the Bible tells you how to get friends. Proverbs 18 and verse number 24. Would you look there with me, please? Proverbs 18, verse number 24. Proverbs 18, 24. The Bible says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So the Bible's advice on how you get friends is to do what? Show yourself friendly. Be friendly to other people. So the focus is, is not on me having friends, but on me being a friend to somebody. And if I'll focus on being a friend to somebody, I'll look up one day and say, I have some friends. But my focus isn't on getting friends. Now let me help you understand something. If you're always negative, you're not going to have friends. 
If you're critical and complaining, you're not going to have friends. You'll have acquaintances, but you won't have friends. You must show yourself friendly. I think I've shared this before, but I, I think I would share it again today. A teacher one day asked her students to list the names of their other students in the room on two sheets of, two sheets of paper and leave a space between each name. And then she said, think of the nicest thing you could say about that classmate and write that in the space after their name. It took the entire period to finish the assignment, but as the students left the room, they handed in their papers. On Saturday, the teacher wrote down the name of every student on a separate piece of paper, and then underneath their name listed all the things their classmates said about them. On Monday, she gave each student their list. She watched as before long the entire class was smiling. Really? She heard one whisper. I never knew I meant that to anyone. Another said, I didn't know others liked me that much. No one ever mentioned the papers in class. But she felt like the exercise had accomplished its purpose. The students were very happy with themselves and with one another. Of course, the year ended and that group moved on. Several years later, one of the students from that class was killed in Vietnam. The teacher attended the funeral. The church was full of friends from school, and one by one they walked by the coffin, and the teacher was the last one to walk by. And as she stood there, one of the pallbearers, also a soldier, came up to her and said, Were you Mark's math teacher? And she said, Yes. He said, Well, Mark talked about you a lot. After the funeral was over, many of the former classmates went, were, went to a lunch provided for those who attended the funeral. Mark's parents were there, and they came up to the teacher. And they told her, we want to show you something. And they took out his wallet, and out of the wallet, they pulled out a piece of paper. They said, they found this on Mark when he was killed, and we thought you might recognize it. And sure enough, it was two worn pieces of notebook paper that had been taped, folded, and refolded many times. And the teacher knew without even looking that it was the paper from that assignment about all the, where it listed all the good things that Mark's classmates had said about him. Thank you so much for doing that, Mark's mother said. As you can see, he treasured that. Then the other classmates started to gather around and Charlie said kind of sheepishly, well, I still have my list. It's in the top drawer of my desk at home. Chuck's wife said, well, Chuck had me put his in our wedding album. Marilyn said, well, I have mine too. It's in my diary. Vicki reached into her purse and retrieved her wallet showing her worn and frazzled list to the group. I carry mine all the time. I think we all saved our lists. And that's when the teacher sat down and cried. She cried for Mark and for his friends that would never see him again. You know how short life is? You know how quickly it passes by? We've talked about this. I, you know, I can, I can recall so clearly um, being the, the kid at family gatherings, looking at my parents and my grandparents. You know, looking at them, figuring out, how can they just sit around and talk? That's where some of you are this morning, huh? That's your age. But you know what? Time kept marching. Grandpa died. Grandma passed away. Hmm? My mom and dad became the grandma and grandpa as I got married then we had the children then our children looked at me as their parent and their grandparents wondered how we could sit around and talk hmm? then my dad has gone to heaven and my wife's dad and her mom and my mom's 90 hmm? and when she passes away 
we're next. And now my kids, who wondered why we're sitting talking, they have kids. And it just keeps, keeps going. And you know what? It just seems like it's been like that. I know you, you hear that, and when you're, when you're 14 and 15 and 16, you think, hey, you got to be kidding me, man. It's, it's forever. When, when you're a kid in high school, it's forever just from Friday to Friday. It, you just can't wait till Friday comes again and you have another weekend. But how many of you know as you get older, Friday to Friday seems like a blink of an eye? Huh? Yeah. It's like, wow, where did that go? We're, we're, we're halfway through 2017. The end of this, uh, this week is the last week. We're six months complete. How quickly life goes. I really understand life's but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And we don't know. It's, it's so easy to forget that life will end one day. And none of us know what day that will be. You know, you're, you're, just, you're just one split second from uh, Brother Taylor was sharing, I think a week ago, that driving down the road and just... A, a fellow, whether he got distracted, looked in at something, or dropped something, and he swerved left of center, and I mean just about hit the back of the truck he's driving. And, and, and by the grace of God, he got it right before he hit head on into another car. But you understand, had that been just a couple seconds earlier, it would have been Don Taylor in a head-on collision. And, and that's, that's all it takes, and you're instantly in eternity. We'd be gone. And things happen that fast. Things happen that quickly. Have you told people you care about that you care about them? Have you told people that you love that you love them? Have you let people know what they mean to you? So I, I'm going to. Don't wait until their body's laying cold in a casket. Do it now while you have an opportunity. Tell them before it's too late to tell them. I guess, I guess what I'm encouraging you to do is be a friend. Be a friend. Now, let me briefly give you five characteristics of true friendship. Can I do that? If I'm going to be a friend, what does that mean? I'll give you five characteristics of being a friend. Number one, a friend listens. Do you know one of the greatest lessons in communication is just to listen? Most of us don't listen. You say, well, what are you doing when the other person's talking? We're thinking about what we're going to say. And we don't even hear what they've, what they've said. We're already just planning on what we're going to say. You remember that uh, one of the presidents who was at a state dinner and people were filing by and I can't remember which president it was, but he was telling everybody who walked by, they would shake their hand and, and he would say, I killed my mother-in-law today. And how many people would say, good to see you too, Mr. President. Good to see you. Thank you. Finally, one guy listened to what he said. And finally, the last guy, when he said, I killed my mother-in-law today, he looked at the president and he said, I'm sure she deserved it, sir. <laughs> finally, somebody listened. Because we don't listen. We, we do that all the time. We'll walk by and say hi to somebody, and they'll say, fine. Fine. I didn't ask how you were. But we thought, but we're not thinking about, we're not listening. A friend listens. If you're, if you think, if you're just thinking what you're going to say next, you're not listening. Listen. A friend listens. Number two, a friend is loyal. Someone said a friend walks in when everyone else walks out. A friend is loyal. A friend defends at all times. A friend will keep things private. Proverbs 17 and verse 9. Proverbs 17 and verse 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. But he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. A friend doesn't, doesn't spread to anybody else when you have messed up. 
That's what a friend does. Just stops with them. I did this in Sunday school. How many of you ever done anything in your life that you wish you hadn't have done? You, you really you say, boy, that was stupid. I, I hope nobody finds out about this. Anybody like that? Okay. Are you, now, now listen, if you felt that way, what do you think that other person feels like whom you're about to go tell somebody what they've done? Hmm. See? A friend covers the transgression. Proverbs 16 and verse 28. Notice what it says, a froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. Oh, did I tell you what he said about you? Well, you know what, you know what she said when, you know, I was with her the other day, here's what she said about you. Why, why would you do that? See, you're trying to separate friends. A friend is loyal. A friend defends. That's friendship. A friend will not let another speak badly of their friend. That's being a friend. Are you understanding now why you said if you have five true friends? See, this is a friend. All right? Number one, a friend listens. Number two, a friend is loyal. Number three, a friend tells the truth. Someone said, a friend is someone who stabs you in the front, not the back. Okay? A friend will tell you the truth to your face. In Proverbs 27, and verse number 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. It, the New Testament calls it speaking the truth in love. You talk to them and you speak the truth in love. You need, you need somebody to tell you if you've offended somebody. You need somebody to be able to tell you if you've, if you've made a mistake or you made a bad decision or you said something you shouldn't have said. You need somebody to be, uh, you give somebody that leeway to, to come to you and say, I think you need to make this right and let them do it. So a friend tells the truth. And then number four, a friend bears your burdens. Galatians 6.2, bear you one, another burden, one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Everybody has burdens. Everybody carries a load. Bear their burden. Don't add to it. Don't add to the burden. Somebody has a wayward child. Somebody lost their job. Somebody struggling with poor health. Somebody just went through a failed relationship. Someone else is going through financial hardship. A friend bears the burden with you. We, we talked about forbearance in Sunday school. Holding one another up. A friend holds you up doesn't weigh you down okay that's a friend so a friend listens a friend is loyal a friend tells the truth a friend bears your burdens number five a friend loves at all times a friend loves at all times proverbs 17 and verse number 17 the bible says a friend loveth at all times and a brother is born for adversity a friend loveth at all times. Love is always doing what's best for the other person. A friend will always do what's best for their friend. Say, well, I don't think they deserve it. That's why we, we, minister, we, we let our speech be seasoned with grace. Say, we want grace. Grace is what? Unmerited favor, undeserved, right? See, uh, let, let no corrupt communication proceed out, out of our mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. Minister grace to your friend. Express your love to them. What's 1 Corinthians 13 teach us? Charity never fails. 
never fails. I just don't know what to do. I don't know what else to do. I know what you do. Love them. Why? That never fails. God said so. Love them. Do what's best for them. Not what you feel like doing. Not what your flesh is screaming to do. Do what you know God says is best for them. Are you lonely today? I'm not asking you if you have friends. What I'm asking you this morning is, are you being a friend? Don't focus on having friends. Focus on being a friend. And let me say this. We all have a friend. He listens. He defends. He protects. He tells us the truth. (laughs) But he bears our burdens. He loves at all times. In fact, he laid down his life for us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege for us to carry everything to God in prayer. Jesus is the best friend you'll ever have. And and he sticks closer than a brother. And he'll always be your friend. He's with you to the end. Let Let me tell you the rest of the story about the pastor in Nevada and the lonely night he had. Several years went by. A Wednesday night service came around. There were about 1,100 people there. Wednesday night Bible study. The pastor had a guest speaker there for the service, and the speaker got up and he said, I have two announcements to make this evening. He said, number one, your pastor has gotten engaged. And everybody clapped and cheered. And he said, number two, You're all invited to the wedding, and it's right now. And with that, the back doors of the auditorium flew open, and his family came in, and he and his bride-to-be came in, and the guest minister performed the wedding that night in front of the church. Tears flowed freely in the auditorium that night. You understand? There, There stood a pastor that many churches would have fired that many churches would have given up on. Many people would have turned their back on and got rid of. Instead, they loved him back to health and loved him back to service. And they got to witness him having a brand new start. Can I tell you, church, that's what a church ought to be about. That's what a church ought to be for, to help people get back. A place where it's a place of caring and a place of healing, a place of friendships, a place which cures loneliness because you have friends and you can be a friend. That's the cure for loneliness. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you, God, for being a friend to us. Thank you, Jesus, for being a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And, Lord, I realize this morning that most of the people who are listening to me today know Christ as their Savior. And, Lord, I pray this morning, I I know there's people in this room who are struggling with loneliness. And, Lord, I'm asking you today, first of all, that they would realize the best friend they have is Jesus Christ. And they would seek to draw nigh to you, and you will draw nigh to them. And secondly, Lord, I pray they'd focus today on who they could be a friend to and not focus on who's being a friend to them. I pray that as they look at just who can I be a friend to, Who can I listen to? Who can I be loyal to? Who can I defend? 
can I help bear their burden? That we would just focus on who can I love? That Lord, they'll look up and they'll realize, wow, I really do have friends too. Because I've showed myself friendly. Minister to hearts today, Lord. Help lonely, hurting hearts this morning. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here this morning would say, Preacher, I, I struggle with loneliness. I really struggle with that at times. But the Spirit of God this morning has showed me the cure for loneliness. Not in, not in just having friendships, but being a friend to somebody. And, and by being a friend, God's going to give me friends. I understand how that works. And, and Pastor, the Spirit of God has just prompted my heart today. He's spoken to my heart. It's encouraged me today. Please pray for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Yes. Amen. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. You may put them down. I wonder how many folks in the room today would say, Pastor, I know that Jesus is my Savior. There's a time in my life when I prayed and I asked Christ to be my Savior. And if I died today, I'm going to heaven because I, my faith and trust is in Jesus alone as my Savior. Here's my hand as a testimony of that, Pastor. Would you slip your hand up? Say that I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put them down. You hear today when say, Pastor, I can't say that for sure. I don't, I don't have the confidence if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that for certain, but I'd like to know that. And my friend, you would like to know that. Would you let me pray for you? Would you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven, but please pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? God bless you. Thank you. The first step to become Jesus becoming your friend is you need to know him as your Savior. In a moment when I pray, we're going to have our invitation. That means I'll finish praying. We'll stand to our feet. The pianist will play. Brother Bob's going to sing. Those who God has spoken to their heart, they're going to come and pray and talk to God before they go home today. If you're in your seat and you've never received Christ as your Savior, when the others are coming to pray, would you slip out and come? I'll meet you here at the front. We'll have someone take a Bible. They've been trained, and they'll show you from the Bible how you can know that you're on your way to heaven, how you can know Christ as your Savior. Don't delay. Don't wait. Just step out immediately. When you hear the piano begin to play, just come. Walk out the door in a few minutes knowing you have a Savior, knowing you have eternal life, and knowing you've got the best friend you'll ever have in life, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. Thank you, Lord, for hands that have been raised, indicating you've spoken to their heart. Lord, thank you for loving us and for caring about us today. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would focus on being a friend. It's expressing our love to those who we care about. We never know when the last day is that we'll see them. Lord, I pray that you'll help each individual now to do what you're bidding them to do in their heart. And these who are not certain if they died, they'd go to heaven. I pray they'd come. Let someone take a Bible and show them how they can know Christ as their Savior. Have your way in each heart and life, please, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you stand to your feet. As you stand, the pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. The Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning, will you please? a friend that's we right. have in Jesus that's right. all our sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry right. everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often pour that what needless pain we bear, oh, we 
because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise for sin? Father, we thank you for this morning and thank you, Lord, that we have a wonderful friend in Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to show ourselves friendly to others. That others will know that somebody cares about them. And we care about them because you care about them. And you care about us. And Lord, I pray that all men will know we're your disciples because we have love one to another. And we show that and express that love to each other. So help us today, Lord, to show ourselves friendly. We love you. We thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. I pray you'll give us a good afternoon and then bring us back this evening for the evening services. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. Thank you.